and Dr. Robert Shapiro. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Carrie for inviting inviting me here to speak today. I'd also like to thank the U.S. Embassy in Argentina uh, for inviting for inviting me to visit. Uh, U.S. Embassy asked asked for me to uh, just to announce they have a new program that's relevant to undergraduate students, college students in Argentina. It's called the Friends of Fulbright Scholars Program, and uh, it, it's a way for Argentinian students to visit the United States for several weeks to take courses. And if you know of any students uh, who are eligible and interested, they should check the relevant website and uh, uh, apply for the program if they're eligible. Now, because I'll be talking about the, the American election and a lot of controversial things in American politics, and I may, I may express certain potentially controversial opinions along the way and evaluations of some of the things that we'll be talking about, I want to just offer the following disclaimer. Anything that I say is my own personal responsibility and it doesn't represent any opinions or analyses of the U.S. Embassy in Argentina or my great university, Columbia University. So if you... So any, any, any misstatements on my part should be blamed, blamed on me. What I want to do is I want to talk about the election and especially uh, I'll have a discussion and answer and, and uh, offer answers to questions you have about the election in, in, our, in the question and answer period. But what I want to do mainly today is put the current election in historical perspective. And the historical perspective has to do with the fact that partisan politics in the United States today are much more conflictual and ideological along liberal, conservative, left, right, ideological lines than, than they've been um, in, in any time in recent years, in, in, the, in the 20th century, through the present. Now this is something that's not, not the, the history of this is something that's not fully appreciated, I think, by people and students and so forth in the United States, especially those of, of new generations that didn't live through that period, like people like me and many of you, and, and, and so forth. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to review the history. And the history, the history, we pick up the history beginning after World War II, where the political parties in the United States were different only to the extent that the parties took different positions. Uh, the Democratic parties taking a more liberal position, Republican parties taking a more conservative position on economic welfare kinds of issues. Uh, the, the, this, this, this was the result of the New Deal political realignment in the United States where the Democratic Party was the party supportive of an active government dealing with, with uh, economic welfare problems. The Republican Party was more, was more of a conservative party, uh, not wanting to spend a lot of money, wanting to keep the budget in balance, and, and, and not engage in um, extensive activism in, the, in that area. And uh, uh, the parties are still that way today. The parties, however, were not different on a wide range of, of, of other issues. And that was, that was because the parties had certain moderating forces in them, particularly on another big issue area today that wasn't such a big issue area back then, but, but was, was the, the issue of basically race, race, racial policy and civil rights. The, during that period in the 20th century, uh, well, well, actually since the Civil War, the Republican Party was the party of civil rights. That is, this was the party that of Abraham Lincoln that fought the Civil War, that freed the slaves, and thereafter they were, they were the, the pro-Civil Rights Party. The Democratic Party was, um, you could either call it the anti-Civil Rights Party, or you, or you could call it a party that was divided on those kinds of issues. That is, the, 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 a strong part of the base of the Democratic Party was the American South. Which was, the, which was the South that had had slaves, that after the Civil War was really the anti-Civil Rights Party. Uh, they established a system of what was called Jim Crow laws that provided for basically racial segregation in the South, and also deprived blacks in the South of the right to vote. That is, there, that is that they, blacks were no longer slaves, but they were not fully enfranchised citizens. But the parties on, on, the, on that issue were, the Democratic Party was moderated on that issue because it was a coalition of Northern liberals and Southern conservatives, so the party opted not to basically make race an issue. It got suppressed within party politics. The Republican Party, in 
the other hand, while conservative on economic welfare type issues, uh, was moderate or liberal when it came to, to issues of, of civil, civil rights. So the parties didn't differ on those issue areas. Um, the parties did, did differ with respect to um, attitudes toward labor unions, and even there the Democratic Party was, was because the South was anti-labor union uh, as, as well. So the party wasn't clearly a pro-labor um, party fully, at least, at least nationwide. And then there were a lot of issues that we have today, like environmental protection, abortion rights, gay, gay rights, and things that, that didn't exist back then. That didn't exist back then. Yeah, well, it helps you have to go closer? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's better? Okay, I'll just stay close. <laughs> so, so the parties were only different on economic welfare issues. They, the the uh, civil rights wasn't an issue. And there were a lot of issues that had not emerged yet. Moving forward in time, after World War, after World War II, and the rise of the civil rights movement in the United States, things changed in a very dramatic way, and a way that kind of raised the, the political heat and emotions in American politics. The, uh, just to make a, long, a very long story very short, by 1964 and 1965, during the presidency of John Kennedy, and especially the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, the Democratic Party transformed itself actually with the help of some Republicans who supported, who supported them in becoming the Civil Rights Party. 1964 was the year the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was enacted that basically uh, provided for equal access to public facilities and so forth, tried to, try to end segregation in a, a, lot of, a lot of areas of uh, economic and social life. And in addition to that, the thing that was the most important and the, the, the thing that broke the Democratic Party as we knew it back then, was the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that assured that blacks would be able to vote nationwide and especially in the South where they were deprived of the right to vote. At that juncture, the Democratic Party became the pro-civil rights party. And there's a story about how Lyndon Johnson signed the 1965 Civil Rights Act, and as he signed it, he allegedly said, there goes the South. At that point, the South became less favorably disposed toward the Democratic Party. And the Republican Party, and this is beginning with the Nixon administration, engaged in what they referred to as the Southern strategy. They made moves to basically attract Southern voters. And so through a process of evolution, the Democratic Party became this, this, the Liberal Party on Civil Rights, the, the uh, anti-Civil Rights elements of the party from the South either left the party, um, members of Congress who had been Democrats became Republicans or were replaced by Republicans, or they were replaced by liberals who, who basically um, lived in, uh, occupied congressional districts that had high, large numbers of blacks who voted, and they, they would elect liberal Southern uh, members of the House of Representatives. So the parties became ideologically distinctive, not only on economic welfare, but also racial issues. And then, the story goes on further, as new issues arose, the parties began to sort themselves through because of internal party politics in such a way that, that the Republican Party became the conservative party on abortion rights, gay rights, environmental protection, a regulation which had always been an issue that had sort of split the parties. Um, and as new issues arose, the parties began to take distinctive positions that, that fit into, could be defined in liberal, conservative, left-right terms. So although it's a little bit, it's a little bit funny there, that is, that is being supportive of gun rights is considered a conservative position in the United States. Being supportive of gun control um, is liberal. Being for capital punishment is, is uh, conservative. Being opposed to capital punishment is liberal. But the parties basically um, divided at the level of, at first, of political leaders along those liberal conservative lines. And that has since penetrated to the level of public opinion. There's a, there's a lot of the academic debate about you know, kind of cause and effect here. What, what, what was causing what? Were leaders responding to voters in public opinion or were leaders leading? leading? And the, 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 at least during the early period, the 60s and, and thereafter, it was really the leaders moving first and, and, then, the, and then their constituents kind of moved along with them. Today, however, um, the leadership strategy has since succeeded because the, the strong base of each party is more extremely liberal and extremely conservative which has actually prevented members of Congress from moderating their views 
if they wanted to, that is, they would be threatened by being challenged in primary elections by somebody more extreme if the voters didn't like their more moderate policies. So the, so the, the causal the cause of, the cause of, the causal effect now goes goes both ways, or maybe more toward the voters, toward the the, the, the political leaders. And this is an, this is really an extraordinary cha change in American politics. Just just for example, when when Adlai Stevenson ran against Dwight Eisenhower for president of the United States, the the parties really weren't that very different from each other. There were differences on issues. You know, the Korean War was a bad issue for the Democrats because we we've, we've gotten into a quite a quagmire there. But that wasn't an issue that that divided on on left right lines. It, it, it divided in terms of um, effective performance of, of government. Um, Fast forward to, to today, you know, we, we, now, we now have an election in the, in the United States. Had we had an election with a mainstream Republican and a mainstream Democrat, we would have had candidates just diametrically opposed on every single issue. Donald Trump is a little different. He's kind of thrown a little wedge in the Republican Party on some issues, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more um, in a moment. The other thing that's happened is as the parties have become more distinctive, um, there was a, there was used to be an old criticism, criticism of the parties that there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two parties. Now there is a huge difference between the two parties. Um, at the same time, the parties have become much more competitive for control of the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate and the presidency. In the post-war period, the presidency went back and forth between the parties. We've had Democratic presidents and we've had liberal presidents. But for a large period, from you know, uh, the, the 19, 1940s up until 1980, the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. So a Republican would be elected president, but he would be in leading a divided government. 1980 was the, was the first year where the Democrats took control of, the, sorry, the Republicans with the election of Ronald Reagan, took control of the U.S. Senate, and thereafter have been competitive for control of the Senate. And so the Senate in the current election is, is competitive. 1994 was a critical year as well because after Bill Clinton got elected in 1992, after three terms of, re of Republican presidents, um, because of uh, problems with health care, his efforts at health care reform and, and other issues, the Democrats suffered a major victory and the Republicans took control of the U.S. House of Representatives for the first time in, in four decades, five decades, four or five decades. And thereafter, They've been competitive for control of the U.S. House of Representatives. Now, a lot of that has to do with the, has to do with the fact that the, the Southern strategy that the Republicans adopted succeeded. What used to be the Solid South, which was supportive of Democrats, was remained the Solid South, except it's solidly Republican in a very, in a very big way, and will very likely vote for Donald Trump in this election um, pretty, pretty forcefully. So the party, so you have a situation now in the United States where the parties are very competitive with each other and ideologically different from each other. And the fact that, the, the, that they're competitive, it's possible now for either party to have control of the presidency, the House, and the Senate, and have, you know, have a unified liberal or conservative government, which also means that they can control appointments to the federal judiciary as well. And, and, and it's, it's also the case that the judiciary has become involved in this ideological conflict because we have conservative ju justices on the Supreme Court who are appointed by Republican presidents who behave in a way that's largely conservative, consistently, and, Demo and liberal judges <coughs> appointed by Democratic presidents who behave largely in a consistently liberal way. It used to be, prior to the, this period of partisan conflict, a Republican would appoint a Republican or conservative judge, but that judge wouldn't necessarily uh, rule in ways that were consistently conservative. The famous case is that when, when Earl Warren was appointed to the, to the Supreme Court, he was a Republican governor of California. He was expected to be you know, kind of conservative, and he was the one who presided over a lot of liberal uh, court cases. Today, the judges seem to adhere to these, these partisan lines, and, and, and it became most apparent in a very um, blatant way when the Supreme Court made the final decision with regard to how the Florida votes would count to be counted in the 2000 election, where the conservative, the conservative justices dominated the court, and in the Bush v. Gore case, Bush the Republican won. So the parts of the courts have been politicized as well, and so they're they're also at stake in these elections. So these elections in the United States have become more ideological and competitive, and the level of competition 
and emotion attached to these, these elections now has gotten increasingly high. The level of partisan conflict was high. In the 2000 election, there was a lot of anger on the part of Democrats that their candidate, Al Gore, won the majority of the popular vote, but lost the electoral vote because of this contested vote in Florida that was decided upon by a conservative court. Uh, and, and, then moving, and, then moving, and then moving forward, you, you see this level of, of partisan conflict. Some of the conflict has actually been personal. When Bill Clinton was president in the 1990s, a lot, there, a, there was a lot of Republican hostility toward him that was both personal and ideological. And a lot of that has actually carried over to the current election, where you have his wife as the uh, Democratic nominee, and you'll see more of that, I'm sure, in the current, in the current campaign. Um, okay, now, in the, how does, what, what are the implications of this for the, for the current, current election? Well, as I, as I said, um, had the Republicans nominated um, kind of a mainstream Republican candidate who was conservative on everything, and the Democrats have nominated either Hillary or Bernard Sanders, who are pretty liberal on everything, you'd have, you'd have a very ideological you know, election here. Donald Trump has thrown a wrench or a brick or a boulder into, in, into all this. That is, his base of support is conservative, but it includes elements within the Republican Party that are actually not so conservative when it comes to issues like protecting entitlements like Social Security and Medicare, and even paying for these things by possibly taxing the rich. Also, he's resonated with voters in terms of his position on free trade, which has hurt workers, hurt the middle class, hurt, 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 hurt work, working people, and then also on immigration. And um, in those policy, policy areas, his, 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 well, on, on trade and immigration, it's a little tricky in terms of defining things as liberal and conservative, but on those other areas, he's, he's not a, a, a standard conservative. And in fact, the part of the base of the Republican Party that he's attracted uh, has been called by uh, uh, James Stimson, a, a well-known political scientist, as conflicted conservatives. These were conservative. These are conservative voters who have, who have been conservative on a lot of issues that the Republican Party has supported, and they voted for Republicans, even though the party didn't take positions that they would have preferred on protecting entitlements and even you know, taxing the rich. Uh, they've gone along up until now, but at, at, at this juncture, uh, Trump is really Trump, and some of the other um, fringe candidates like um, Ben Carson and, and Carly Fiorina who were running, kind of, you know, were capitalized on their, on their disgruntlement. These, these are voters that uh, have, have, have seen that the Republican Party hasn't done enough to help them, and especially they, they, they haven't thwarted policies of the Obama administration that they, that they dislike. Even though, as we all I think, well know, that the Republican Party really fought Obama and his administration tooth and nail to prevent health care reform from being enacted but, but, and, and other things, but they just couldn't stop him. Um, so he's resonated with, with those voters. So the, the Republican Party is in a little bit of a current state of turmoil because the mainstream Republican Party, as we knew it, doesn't quite control their own party at this point. And that's, that's part of the context um, for, for the election. Okay, so what I, I want to talk, I want to get back to the election, but, but before I get there, what I want to do is I want to show you uh, with some graphs the nature of the transformation that's occurred. Okay. Okay. These, the, these, two, these two guys here are Howard, Howard Rosenthal and Keith Poole. This is a very, this is a, this, this is an academic um, reference here. They developed a way of measuring the degree of conservative, conservative voting behavior of members of Congress and the House of Representatives. <coughs> conservative voting behavior or liberal voting behavior. And they, they developed a scale, and I don't need to go into the details of the scale, but, but, but it's, it's a way of showing you the nature of the change that's occurred in American politics. Okay, this is a, uh, is a graph, and I've got the, my little laser pointer here. This top line is supposed to be blue, it's, it's the Republicans. This is the mid-1970s the mid right here. The transformation of the party on racial issues began here, but this is the period where, where the parties began to become much more distinctive along consistently liberal and conservative lines, such that members of the House, this is the House of Representatives, have, have voted more conservatively over time, while at the same time the Democrats have voted consistently more liberally. And it's especially in the South because the the members of the House of Representatives in the South 
who were, who were Republicans were replaced by liberal Democrats. So the distance, the gap between the parties is having increased, representing party partisan conflict and disagreement over policy issues. This is this is this is not the identical graph, but it's the same graph for the U.S. Senate, which shows that the, the distances between the two parties have been increasing. And this is a graph of, of the, just the differences, the Republican versus Democrat difference in ideological voting has increased in the House and also increased in the Senate um, during, during this period. That represents elite level conflict, ideological conflict. These particular data are more on economic welfare issues, but when you, when you bring in other issues, you get basically the same kind of picture as well. Um, okay. Now, th this graph is a little bit different. This is a graph simply, um, th th this is based on a measure of what um, James, what James Stimson put together, of what's called liberal, conservative, or left-right public mood. It's ideological opinions of the American public. And I'm just putting, I just want to put this in, in context because it matters with regard to elections. What's usually happened is that when, now, the moving up means moving in a liberal direction, okay? What's usually happened, and it's, it's not perfectly regular, but the pattern is pretty consistent. When public opinion moves in a liberal direction, it precedes the election of a Democratic president. So this is the, this is the move that led to the election of Lyndon Johnson and uh, John Kennedy. And then, because of some, either, either because the, the liberal administration began to enact liberal policies, or because the public figured well, we've elected a liberal president, therefore our policy is going to move in a liberal direction. Maybe it's moving in too liberal a direction. So they've shifted course and want in, in, in a conservative direction for the purposes of moderating policy, leading to the election of a Republican, in this case Richard Nixon. Nixon gets elected. They perceive things going too conservatively. Ultimately what happens is Jimmy Carter gets elected. There's a liberal move here. Jimmy Carter gets elected, public opinion moves in a conservative direction. Ronald Reagan gets elected as a result of that. Public opinion then perceives that things are going too conservatively. Let's reverse course, let's move in a liberal direction. Uh, this is through Reagan and Bush, the election of uh, um, Bill Clinton. He, he gets elected, perception then becomes things are too conservative. Let's move in a conservative direction electing a conservative president, George W. Bush. Things are perceived as going too much in a conservative direction. Elect Barack Obama, Obama gets elected. Things are too liberal, let's move conservative. Now, my point in presenting this is to talk about the, it's kind of an interesting regularity, but this suggests right here that things are moving in a conservative direction. That, seemed, that would, might be expected to precede the election of a conservative president which would be a Republican president. So this is, is currently a very, at least based on these data, if you believe the data, a context which is very good for the election of a Republican. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that, is, is that this is in fact, this was supposed to be a good year for the election of a Republican president. Not necessarily because of this, of these ideological movements, but because there, there's widespread misperception perception, excuse me, perception in the United States that the Obama administration has been unsuccessful. So when Donald Trump says we're not winning, that has a lot of that has a lot of resonance. Now, political now, in the United States, all the experts and pundits and party leaders, and I have to confess, and I'll raise my hand, <laughs> political scientists completely failed in predicting that Donald Trump would get the nomination. Okay, so we're not good at everything. We couldn't predict these things. We couldn't predict, we couldn't predict the fall of the, Soviet Union, of the Soviet Union. However, political scientists did come to the conclusion, correctly, that this was a very good year for the Republicans uh, for reasons of this pattern here or, be, or because of the misperception of the I keep saying misperception because we could debate about whether it's true or not. The perception, um, we, can debate, we can debate whether this is true or not, because of the, of the perception that the Obama administration has not done as well as it should in terms of the economy's got better, but there's still some shortcomings in, which we can talk about. Foreign policy, as the Republicans claimed, 
during the, uh, public, the primary debates is a disaster. We're not, we're, you know, we're not winning or losing on all, all, kinds of, all kinds of fronts. So this meant that because it's a good year for Republicans, all of the good Republican politicians and leaders out there who aspire to become President of the United States uh, had an incentive to run for the presidency because if they could get the nomination, there's a good chance they could get elected. And this is way this is way back in the, uh, in, the, in the in the spring of 2015. That's when all that's when all that's when it all started. That's when that's really when the primary, the, the invisible primary, as we call it, starts. And the Republicans, arguably, when they had their initial 17 candidates, had a lot of good candidates. At that moment in time. Governor Christie of New Jersey, John Kasich, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio were thought to be very good candidates. There were, now granted, there were other ones out there, I could list some, about four or five other ones, who were good, who chose not to run, but it was a good year. And also, now you might say, well, with so many candidates, I mean, wouldn't the candidates be a little more thoughtful and selective in making their decision? Well, the, the answer is, you know, they have to take their chances. And the one thing that gave them an incentive to do it is that because of the Supreme Court rulings in the United States, individual candidates are still restricted in terms of how much money individuals can donate them. There's, there's a limit. However, they could have available to them unlimited money from, private, from independent groups or political action committees, the PACs and the super PACs, which meant that all of these candidates had um, either PACs or super PACs or individual rich donors giving them lots of money, or, or, the, or the candidates might be independently wealthy. And they would at least have enough money available so that they, they could run in the, the first primaries, Iowa the caucuses, New Hampshire primaries, the Nevada caucuses, and South Carolina. They just needed enough money to get through there because if they, if they did poorly, they could just drop out. That's it. But if they did well enough, they would be able to raise more money. So, but the thing that really, I, political scientists would argue that it was just from a, just from a, a rational choice, cost-benefit standpoint, you don't want to run unless you think it, you have a chance of winning. And they all thought they, they had a chance of winning the presidency, and I don't know, what the heck, let's, let's do it. On the Democratic side, we can ask, why were there so few? Well, for, for, for the opposite, in some ways, the opposite reason. This was a, perceived as a bad year for a Democrat to run. That is because of these misperceptions of the Obama administration. And also because Hillary Clinton presented herself, was a very formidable candidate. The only and um, the only candidate who had the other candidate who had a chance of uh, possibly challenging her, which would, would, would have been Joseph Biden, the vice president, but he, op he opted not to. But once Biden was out of the picture, that was that was it. That was it. nobody else. You know, it, it's basically anybody else trying to run perceived not having a, not having a chance, with the exception of Bernie Sanders, who was running as a fringe candidate, basically doing the same kind of thing the Democratic Party that Trump was doing in the Republican Party where he was emphasizing issues of basically the influence of money in politics and inequality that had a lot, that had a lot of resonance in the Democratic base that thought the Obama administration wasn't trying hard enough to deal with those kinds of things. We could talk more about, about Sanders later on. So that, that's, that's, that's the context, in the context of this, of this particular political history. All right, now in terms of this partisan conflict pervading American politics, I showed you the data for the elite level. What I, what I want to show is, is just the transformation of public opinion, which for me is, is quite extraordinary. Because I wrote a book, the book The Rational Public that I wrote was published based on um, data through the 1980s. And through that time, when public opinion changed on any issue, all segments and subgroups of the population on issues that were salient enough, visible enough, to be asked about in opinion polls. We're not talking about trivial issues, we're talking about big issues covered widely in the press. All subgroups, based on new information reported through the media, events, what political leaders were saying, political debate, if public opinion changed, everybody moved in the same direction. There might be differences in opinions, in terms of racial differences in opinions, differences by income, differences by party, differences by region. But if opinion changed, everybody moved in the same direction. They were getting the same information, uh, they were making the same kinds of evaluations of the information, and would move in the same direction. So for example, when uh, things went bad for Jimmy Carter as President of the United States, and his popularity rating dropped, 
everybody's rating had been dropped. Whites, blacks, men, women, people living in the South, the North, and also Democrats and Republicans and Independents all moved in the same direction. There were no partisan kind of filters that at work here, filtering the information in some way, or making judgments about it. What we find now is that when opinions change, different racial groups move in the same direction, um, income groups, region, but not partisanship. We're not, we're not people who think of themselves as liberals and conservatives. Their opinions have increasingly diverged across, and what's striking about that, it's not across a few issues, it's across a lot of issues, and a, and a lot of new issues in ways that are just are very striking. And people, uh, I'm sure a lot of, I'm sure most of you haven't seen the whole range of things that I'm gonna, I'm gonna present here. I just wanna give you, just give you a feel for this. And, and this is regardless of whether public opinion is moving in cycles, or moving fully just in a liberal direction, in some cases, or in a conservative direction. When they're moving, Democrats and Republicans are moving differently, either in different directions or in the same directions at much different rates. And here, here's, here's a quick sweep through the, uh, the data. Okay. This is a case, <laughs> this is public opinion for spending more on improving and protecting the nation's health care. The dotted line, represents Republicans who are less supportive of spending more money than Democrats. Now, the parties have always differed on these things. Remember I said the parties differed on economic welfare issues, and this, and this, is, this, is a, this has been found at the elite level and at the level of public opinion. But the main point is the differences here were noticeable, but they've gotten bigger out here. And this is less striking than some of the others that I'm gonna show you right now. This is a graph of opinions expressed that are in favor of decreasing or cutting spending on these issues. Um, and here you see the Republicans are more supportive of cutting spending, but the gaps have been getting wider. This is protecting the environment. Um, maybe a, a 10 point or so difference here, but that difference has gotten wider. Now this, this is, this is, a, this is a, actually a very important issue area because the, the issues I've talked about thus far have been largely domestic policy issues. These partisan differences have entered the realm of national security and foreign policy issues in a way that uh, has been unexpected. It was always, it used to be thought in the United States that partisan politics stopped at the water's edge. When it came to defense, uh, diplomacy and all that, everybody, there was a consensus. During, this is the period after the Vietnam War. After, beginning with the, the Vietnam War and the, and the Carter administration, the Democratic Party started to be, be perceived as the party that was basically less militant, less supportive of use of force in foreign policy. During the Vietnam War era, there was this distinction between doves and hawks. But the hawks were, a lot of Democrats were hawks. The Vietnam War was Lyndon Johnson's war, and the Democrats were supportive. So there, a, a partisan gap emerged here, with the Republicans more supportive of increasing debt defense spending. This big spike that occurred here, this is 1979, a very famous year. This was the year of the Iran hostage crisis. This was the year of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, a sign of U.S. weakness perceived, again, perceived weakness, similar to what we were seeing today. Um, public opinion moved in a direction more supportive of the, the, the spending more on national defense. Now, everybody was moving in the same direction there, as we're still in the 70s. But what, what, what happened beginning in the 1990s is that the parties became, became different. And by the time Bush took office, it was clearly the case that the Republican Party was the party more supportive of using unilateral military force in foreign policy. And the Democratic Party is the party, particularly under Obama, that's more supportive of use of diplomacy. Obama recently spoke at the U.S. Air Force Academy graduation, in which he emphasized to the officers, the cadets graduating, that it was important to engage in diplomacy and foreign affairs before using force. And, and, and so that represents that difference. So we, we find this emergence not only on domestic issues, but also national security and foreign policy issues. Uh, this, this is, I'm just gonna run through a set of issues. This is public opinion toward preferences for a, a bigger government or a smaller government, where the bigger government would be more actively engaged in economic welfare policy making, regulation, and so forth. Uh, this, this, this represents um, opposition that is, the percent prefer a smaller government providing fewer services, so small government rather than big. The partisan differences here have, have jumped from 19 percentage points to uh, fully 59 percentage points, 80 versus 31. 
That's extraordinary. I mean, as I said, I say, I, I say it's extraordinary because I wrote a book in which this, this kind of thing never happened prior to that. Um, this is the issue of, uh, uh, in terms of opposition, people thinking that there's too much government regulation. Overall, public opinion has moved in a conservative direction if you combine both groups, but it's Republicans much more so than Democrats. Very little difference down here at certain junctures, but here a very wide gap. <coughs> The, uh, basically, the declining support for tougher environmental laws. Um, <coughs> that, that declining support is, is because is because Republicans and Democrats have, have <coughs> differ sharply on this. Back in the early 1990s, the difference was only seven percentage points. And now the difference is on the is, is at least on these data 46 points. That's huge. To use Donald Trump's favorite word. Um, Support for labor unions, the percent with a favorable opinion about labor unions. It's always been the case that, that um, Democrats have had more favorable opinions, but it's, it's become even more so in later years. Uh, this is another op opinion item on labor unions. Labor unions are necessary to protect workers' rights. Democrats strongly supportive of that, Republicans not. Uh, this is the issue of gun rights, which is which, which Donald Trump will make a major issue in the, in the election since he and Hillary differ substantially on it. Uh, the, the Republicans have been more supportive of gun rights uh, than, than Democrats, and even more so in recent years. Um, now, on some other issues, the public has moved in a liberal direction, where Democrats have moved more liberal in the sense of being, being less supportive of capital punishment. Um, the, US, the public in the United States has always been substantially supportive of the death penalty for murder. Uh, except the gap is, except Democrats less so now. Uh, the reason for it, you might ask, has to do with the fact that there have been a lot of recent, in the last uh, 15 years, highly publicized cases of individuals on death row waiting to be executed who were found to be innocent because of new DNA evidence. And that's really changed people's opinions toward capital punishment. I mean, even some among Republicans, that's dropped off a little bit, but more so among Democrats. But this has now become a very big partisan issue at the level of political leaders. If you saw the Republican Party debates, the leaders were you know, critical of, um, of the Democrats on this. A uh, huge gap there. More liberal views toward legalizing marijuana. Um, a big change on, on that issue. Back in 1970, there was very little partisan difference. And now there's on the order of about a 20 point difference, with Democrats and independents more supportive than Republicans. Um, and as you know, marijuana is actually legal in some states in the United States at this, at this point. Same-sex marriage, there, there's always been a gap. The gap has gotten wider. There, there's some opinion questions that actually show a bigger increase in the gap there. Gay, mar gay marriage, a highly partisan issue. Now, this, this, is, this is one that really is striking. In 1998, immigration was not a partisan issue in the United States at the level of political leaders or of the public. But today, now, it's, it's a... It's a the party gap here is enormous. Republicans more um, more likely to think it's, it's important to deal with constraining illegal immigration. Uh, this has to do with immigrants and refugees coming to the United States. Republicans much more opposed to that. They think it's a, more likely to think it's a critical threat to the nation. Uh, in, improving now, although the overall movement, I should add, is that the overall movement is actually in a liberal direction, more supportive of. Uh, of, of favorable immigration policies, but, but, the, but the, it's being driven heavily by, by the Democrats. Preferential treatment for minorities is an issue area where there's not a lot of support, but in, to the extent that it's been changing, it's actually been increasing because Democrats have, have become more positive toward it. Uh, and, and that's related to the fact that, uh, that black and Latino populations are, are a more important part of the Democratic base today as well. Uh, anyway. An existing partisan gap that's increased noticeably, going from 18 points to 40 points over a period of uh, 25 years. Uh, attitudes toward institutions. One thing that's happened in the United States is that there's been a decline in confidence in institutions in the United States. But, the, but on some areas, the, there's some of their partisan differences. Republicans are more positive toward uh, major companies than Democrats are. Uh, with regard to the confidence in the military, actually, opinion toward the military has become much more, uh, confidence has actually increased in recent years, from, and that, that makes it different from other issue areas. But here you can see, you know, very, very big party differences where the Republicans have more confidence than Democrats. 
Um, in terms of confidence in the executive branch, and you see a cycle here, it depends on whether the, Republic, the president's a Republican or a Democrat. That affects what people think. This is the di these are differences in the popularity rating of members of parts of the public who are who identify with the party of the president versus the office or members of the opposition party. So during 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 the 1980s, uh, among Republicans, their approval of the president was this high. Among the Democrats, it was this high. Um, during this period in the 1990s, this represents Democrats' approval of, of, um, of, of Bill Clinton versus Republican approval of Bill Clinton. Notice the very wide partisan gap here compared to the earlier period where the gap was much less. Okay. Now, these convergences here represent just unique periods. This was the, the, the first Gulf War where everybody rallied around President George W. H. W. Bush, and this was right after the 9-11 attacks in the United States. But, but these, these periods of goodwill were short-lived. Uh, this is a table, unfortunately you can't, you can't see this very well, but when Jimmy Carter was president, um, the, di the differences in the approval ratings of Republicans versus Democrats was only 22 points. Democrats were more supportive of Carter, Republicans less so, but the difference was 22 points. Jump to Obama and to Bush is 59 points, and then Obama is 68 points. That really shows you how, how partisan conflict has affected things. And then the other piece of this is, is where partisan conflict not only affects, it's not only related to people's attitudes, but it's related to people's perceptions of reality or ostensible facts. Um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who you might remember, who's a U.S. Senator and academic, once said, people are entitled to their opinions, but they're not entitled to their facts. We should agree on the facts. Okay, now this, this graph, I have to kind of talk about this in a little bit of detail here. This covers the period from March 2004 to March 2006. It's the proportion of the public, this is, a, this is Republicans only, who in, responded to polls by saying that they thought that Iraq and Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, even after it was widely acknowledged, even by the Bush administration, that Saddam and Iraq did not have weapons. But among Republicans in the event, although there were some Republican leaders, now, now Republican leaders here didn't make a big deal that they weren't announcing left and right, they just quietly acknowledged. Um, the word didn't get spread to the Republican base, that is Republicans on the order of 40 or 50 percent in this period, and even here, thought that Saddam had weapons. And even, this, this, this graph here, are the opinions of the best educated Republicans with some graduate school education. So their partisanship is affecting their perceptions of things. Among Democrats, the, you know, basically among Democrats, relatively fewer, although a fair number here. But among the best educated Democrats, you know, by 2006, nobody thought there were WMDs. So partisanship has really had an effect that's, you know, I wrote a book called The Rational Public. This, this raises questions about it. Do we blame the public for these opinions, or do we blame political leaders for not making clear what the facts are? We can talk about that if you like. Uh, this, one, this, is, this is the percent of Republicans who responded to survey questions in 2009 and 10 that, um, in which they, they said that they believed that, that Barack Obama was a Muslim. Okay, now, now, the, now, now remember, now these percentages are 10, 20, 30. This is in 40, 50, 60. So these aren't enormous percentages. But still, and even among the best educated Republicans, compared to the Democrats, and especially the best educated Democrats, um, perception, and, and, and there are different perceptions of, of, of global warming and what's causing global warming. Republicans are less likely to believe in global warming caused by humans, Democrats more so, even, even though the net changes in the direction of acknowledging that there's global warming. Um, and and, and he, these, are my, these, these are the two, these are the ones that might, you might find the most troubling. People's comments about the economy, whether they think the economy is doing well or will be going well. This is in, in the, in, during the Bush administration. Republicans were much more optimistic and thought things were going, would, would be going better and have been going better in, in terms of the economy. Democrats less so. Obama gets elected president, and all of a sudden, Democrats are more likely to think things are going well, and Republicans less so. It gets worse. You ask people about their family finances. You know, uh, Demo uh, Republicans, uh, yeah. Um, 
Republicans more optimistic, um, Obama gets elected, and all of a sudden Democrats are more, um, you know, more, more optimistic about their family finances. So th th this partisan conflict has really been shaking things up in very, in, in very, in very striking ways. I'm sorry, and the independents. I'm sorry, and the independents and the Republicans are just like that in that graph. Uh, no, in, in this graph, the, in this graph, the independent, the independents look more like the uh, the Demo more like the Democrats. That is, this is the this is the Republicans here, and and they're more optimistic. Then they get less optimistic. It's not clear where the independents are. I think it overlaps with this. I'm not, actually, actually, I don't know because I can't tell. Could they could be here? Uh, but back here, they look they look a little bit more like the well, the independents are the ones who are a little more objective. They're in between, and then Obama gets elected, and they don't change. Whereas the Democrats and the Republicans reverse. The independent. That's a good point. The independents are a good frame of reference on this. Okay, so we're, we're left we're left with the current election in terms of what's going to decide the election. Um, there there are, I guess two things. I would argue that there are three things to keep track of. One is, is the size of the base of each party. That is, who are the vote, how many voters are, are loyal Democrats will vote for the Democrat, loyal versus loyal Republicans. Secondly, tied to that is the meaning of Republican and Democratic identification is really associated with issue positions. Back in the 1950s, voters who said they were Republicans um, were not very issue or ideologically oriented. They regarded the Republican Party identification as their team or their brand, a brand name. Fast forward till today, people think of basically their, their, their loyalty to a party as being um, you know, an important identification and an important brand identification. But that brand identification now means a lot in terms of where they and their party stand on policy issues. Back in the 1950s, it might have just meant differences on economic welfare. Now it means differences on everything. Uh, now Trump has thrown a wrench into that, and these conflicted conservatives deviate from that. But, th but that's the second part of, of, of the thing to pay, things to pay attention to. And then the third one is, okay, what's ultimately going to decide the election? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be how much of the base of each party goes out to vote for their party. That's the first part. And you might ask, well, not everybody is part of the, of the base. Or might not everybody might not be necessarily happy with their with their party. So you've got undecided voters or independents or moderates out there. How are they going to vote? Well, there's reason to believe that well they might not vote at all. But there's also reason to believe they might just vote on the basis of if they're torn between the parties, they might just they might base their decision on their perception of how well is the incumbent party doing. And there are theories in political science that argue this. If they think the incumbent party do, is doing okay, they'll stick with it. If they think it's not winning, because Donald Trump is going to emphasize all over the place and his supporters, they, they might not necessarily enthusiastically vote for Trump, but they might say, well, let's vote for a change, and, and because the change is better than what we currently have. So the, so the performance, the perceived performance is going to matter a lot. Perceived performance at what? Well, it could be like 1992, where it's the economy stupid people will be making judgments on how well the economy is doing. So anybody interested in, in predicting the election should pay attention to the economy. <coughs> or it's foreign, it, it's not far, it's, it's foreign affairs, but it's not foreign policy issues like you know, support for NATO, or, or even necessarily trade, you know, individual trade pacts or something like that. But it may simply be how well are we doing on the major international conflicts that we're involved in. Are we winning? In Syria, in Iraq, um, it, 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 it may be looked at. It could subsequently, subsequently be looked at in a very favorable way if the Democrats win. That it might have been a very good thing that the, that Obama withdrew American troops from Iraq and Afghanistan because if the troops were there and not successful and were taking high casualties, that would be perceived as not winning and bad performance. By the same token. If things, even without that, if things go badly, that is, if ISIS or Assad uh, ascends further in Iraq and Syria, and it looks like we're not winning because of that, because of Obama's failure to engage more directly earlier in Syria, that could do the, do the party in the election. That will reflect on Hillary Clinton, because she, she's gonna, she has tied herself to the Obama administration. If she didn't do it, the Republicans would inevitably tie her to it, so she, she figured, I guess, that she should do it. Uh, on the other hand, if the economy, and now here, if the economy gets worse, if there's a recession, if, 
you, if you ask the question, well, how can Donald Trump win? If there's a major recession in the United States, that's going to work in his favor. If there's a terrorist attack, that could work in his favor. On the other hand, if the economy improves, that won't hurt the Democrats, it could help them. If some successes start to occur in Iraq and Syria, and you know, I, I keep watching the news every day with regard to what's happening in Mosul, Fallujah, Rahma, okay, that kind of thing. Uh, if things improve, and during the debate, the, the Hillary Clinton-Trump debate on foreign policy ought to be a very interesting one, because Hillary is going to try to engage in issues, and not, who knows what Trump is going to do during the debate. But Trump will have an incentive to emphasize any you know, lack of success. And so the things to watch in the news are the economy and, and what's happening in, in foreign conflict. With regard to the election itself, oh, oh this, I, I, I brought this one, this is especially here. Um, partisanship has also entered into the proportion of the public that's, that's more sympathetic with the Israelis and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It used to be the case that Republicans and Democrats were equally supportive, sympathetic toward Israel. Uh, they're both pretty supportive, except Republicans even more so. The gap widened around 9-11, terrorist attacks, and then they've widened further because of, I think, I think the relations between Netanyahu and, and, and Obama have kind of penetrated to uh, public opinion here. And also, by the way, if you're following this issue, Bernie Sanders has nominated two delegates to the uh, Democratic Platform Committee who have more adverse views toward uh, U.S. policy toward uh, Israel, less adverse toward, more, more adverse toward Israel. Uh, in terms of how things are going in the, uh, you know, in, in, in Iraq, uh, this is the percent of people who think it was, who thought it was a mistake to go there. There used to be a big partisan difference, but now the partisan difference is less. This is actually, this deviates from the pattern of increasing foreign differences in foreign policy or on any, any issue. The reason it's converged is that Republicans now associate the war with Barack Obama, and Democrats still think of it as Bush's war. That's, that's why they've converged. It's very, it's very, it's very strange. Um, and the same thing with the war in Iraq. There were big differences here, but then the, the war became, you know, Obama's war, and so, so the, the Republicans are more um, negative on the war now because of that, and the Democrats are more positive because of that. Um, it's no longer, it's Obama's war. That's the same defense thing. Okay, this is the election. But in a, in a nutshell, okay, I, I'm, this, this is the source for what I'm, I'm now going to present you. This, this is taken from a particular website of Larry Sabato, a professor at the University of Virginia. This is, this is a summary of the election. Now, these, this, the, this color should be blue, dark blue. This is light blue. This is dark blue. This is bright red, and these are lighter shades of red. But these are the red states and the blue states. This is the election right here. Uh, as you know, the election in the United States isn't a national popular vote election. It's an election determined by how many electoral votes each candidate gets. They get electoral votes by winning a state. So in Ca California has 55 electoral votes. It has 55 because it has 53 members of the House of Representatives and two members of the Senate. Whichever candidate wins California will get all 55 electoral votes. It's a winner-take-all system. A candidate needs 270 electoral votes to win. The election will not be a national election. To the extent that there's campaigning, it, to, to the extent that a candidate campaigns in any, in, in a, in any state, the, the light, these light blue states, Ohio, Florida, Ohio, um, Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, Virginia, North, North Carolina and Virginia are here, Nevada, Colorado. Um, or th these are states that are, that are going to be the decisive states. These are the states that have not consistently gone for uh, Democrat or Republican candidates. The, the dark blue are the, are the solid Democratic states. The dark red, this is the solid South, by the way. This was the South that used to be Democratic. Okay. Um, the elections are really going to be decided in, that, in, 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 those, in those particular states to the extent that, that the candidates can, to the extent that candidates campaign in California. Well, Donald Trump thinks he can win California, so he's going to campaign because of his connections to Hollywood. He thinks he's going to be competitive there. But normal, normally, the, um, the candidates would only campaign in New York 
which would put, although Trump is from New York and he thinks he can win New York, so, there, so he'll campaign there. But in past elections, the candidates would not campaign in New York because it's, it, everybody knows it's going to vote Democratic. But they might campaign there to raise money. Okay, so that's the only reason. So in, in New York, we would normally get no, no campaign advertising there because nobody who has the candidates you know, would, would not want to waste their money. But anyway, th this, is, this is where the election is going to be decided. That's where, we are, that's where we are today. The outcome of the election, because of the ideological differences between the parties and the fact that they're so competitive, um, means it's going to be a, a, a hard-fought election. This was supposed to be a great year for the Republicans. I mean, they're upset now with Trump, but they're even more upset because this election was theirs to lose, and then they lose it. And now their strategy is basically to uh, see what happens with Trump, but see if they can hold on to the Senate and the House. For the Democrats, this was a, this was a tremendously important election because if they bought, because they were on, they they they, they foresaw that they could, they would be possibly likely to lose it, even though the demography in the United States is moving in their their, their direction. Uh, stakes are, are high. If Republicans get, get elected, they can undo a lot of what the Obama administration did. They can control the Supreme Court, um, and that's where we are today. And, and the issues at stake, the issues at stake in, in terms of ideology, are both domestic and a fair number of foreign policy issues as well, which is obviously very relevant to this group. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you.